Welcome back, everyone, to another issue of Rabbit Hole Stories. And today we had Fernando on. He's the head of communications and just broadly head of marketing at Blockstream. And an amazing dude, Ian. That was... Yeah, really cool guy. Time just flew by. And when I checked the clock, I was like, oh, we're over an hour already because we kind of kind of keep it short. Um, mm. And we talked about loads of things, Blockstream as a whole, his perception of the media, and especially how to talk to people who are not yet into Bitcoin. How did you like the episode? Mate, really cool guy. I really liked this, the episode. I found it fascinating about the whole journey from Argentina to, mm-hmm. um, you know, his mum made a difficult decision to, to get them out of there. And we discussed a little bit about social politics and all that sort of yep. stuff. So that's my bag. I love that sort of stuff. So that's what I really got from it. And uh, I know you guys are going to enjoy this. But before we do, remember, if you're going to Prague, use that mm-hmm. discount code RHSPOD. It's in the description with all the links and get your 10% off of BTC Prague. And we'll see you there. And as always, stay curious. Sorry about all the side chat, guys. Welcome back to yet another episode here at Rabbit Hole Stories. We've got the fantastic Fernando with us this week. Fernando, how has your day been so far, bro? And do you want to tell us who you are and what you're all about in the Bitcoin space, please, sir? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm currently in Istanbul. Uh, I've been here for almost a month. So I'm just enjoying the city, the food. I feel like I'm bloated as hell because of everything. <laughs> And I think I told myself, like, okay, I'm, I'm going to cut out bread from my life. And that was like a week before we came down to Istanbul. So bad timing, bad timing. But, uh, yeah, uh, going through it right now, it's a super, super amazing day. The culture is nice. And, uh, yeah, uh, enjoying life. How about you guys? Yeah, as they say, we're living the dream. And um, we've been trying to get you on the podcast for a while because um, I love your content on uh, Bitcoin Twitter. You seem to be one of those people that quite uh, speak quite um, honestly, and um, you're you're sort of you've got a good sense of what's going on within the ecosystem and the, the sentiments that are out there. Um, how did you get interested in doing that sort of stuff, and um, how is that evolving for you? If you like my tweets, you should see my draft folder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah, it's uh, full of full of fire that I have to like. Uh... <laughs> Just uh, keep it, keep it as a strategic, you know, ammunition. Uh, no, mm-hmm. no. It's, uh, thank you, thank you for that. I, I, I appreciate that. I think uh, Bitcoin Twitter is a, uh, is a, is a, well, it's a place that I owe a lot of my like proper like journey. Uh, mm-hmm. like, uh, a lot of people that I, um, that I follow back in the days. I think I kind of like um, discovered them on Twitter, and then you know from that touch point on, I you know went deeper into whatever content they were they were making. So. Yeah, uh, the the fact that you're saying that means a lot. So so thanks a lot. Um, uh, in terms of my Bitcoin uh, origin story, uh, well, I think there's a lot of factors that come into play. Uh, that once you get introduced to Bitcoin, you either get it or you don't, uh, or like or it kind of like sets uh, um, you know it sets a time for like how long you need in order to really uh, grok it. I I believe like Bitcoin is a very um, individual uh, journey. You kind of like should at least uh, take it as an autodidactical uh, journey where you just sit down, you read, uh, you consume content, you study it, and uh, you kind of like take your time to unlearn a lot of the things that you have learned um, by being part of the (laughs) public education system. Um, But I think there was a lot of factors before all of that that kind of like made it easy for me. And that is the fact that I'm from Argentina and uh, Argentina has had just a chronic uh, problem with uh, inflation and, uh, you know, for decades and decades. So um, the fact that I was a, a kid back in 1989, where, where my mom ch- chose to emigrate from Argentina to Norway uh, because of a hyperinflationary dumpster fire that happened in 88, 89, um, throughout my my childhood or, or like as coming of age, I just kept going back to Argentina and seeing things just get worse and worse and uh, inflation always being uh, a topic of conversation in the media, amongst families, among friends. So I was thinking to myself, like, well, what's going on here? Like, it's obvious that we know what the problem is. We all agree on the problem. Like, what, what, why can't we agree on fixing this, right? And also the fact that the same, uh, for the same reason that my mom emigrated in, in her late 20s, that she was a very young mom, um, and I kept seeing families still emigrating, uh, going to Spain, going to the U.S., going to anywhere, basically, uh, trying to find the better opportunities outside of Argentina. I was like, why does this keep uh, repeating? What, what's 
what's going on here really? So that led me into, you know, trying to understand what inflation is because I kept hearing about it all the time and then trying to understand the reasons of it. That led me to like my own personal path into discovering, uh, you know, the Austrians. Um, so like, you know, the classic Austrian economics uh, authors and, and books. And then once um, a friend of mine introduced me to Bitcoin back in 2017, I would say it took me a little while to get a little bit in touch of the like the more technical stuff. And I, to this day, I, 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 I'm kind of like, I am a perma noob. I, I, I don't really have a super good grasp of the, the, the technical side of Bitcoin, but um, I understood it from like a monetary uh, principle. So that was kind of like it. And then from then you try to like uh, go into, you choose different rabbit holes and you try to like uh, learn more about the things that concerns you, uh, that you're interested in, that or or, is, or at least is connected to something that you're interested in. And uh, yeah, I mean, that rabbit hole journey continues to this day. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's something wonderful that I think uh, I'm very appreciative of, the, the fact that I discovered Bitcoin, mm -hmm. but also appreciative of the fact that you get exposure to so many bright minds and uh, so many, uh, yeah, it's just good people. Uh, so it's, uh, yeah, big, big uh, life moment uh, for me personally, yeah. Yeah, and I guess uh, if you lack technical understanding, you, you kind of work at the right company, so it's just one message away to, <laughs> to yeah, see what's know, going every, on. In every, in every company chat where I have a question, I'm easily the, the biggest idiot in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's a, that's a really privileged position to be in, too, because then you, can, you have so many great people that you can uh, learn from and soak up uh, knowledge from. So, yeah, it's a super privileged uh, place to be in. Yeah, I, I always remember the um, the HBO series, The Newsroom, with uh, Jeff Daniels, where he's, <laughs> in one of the episodes, he's the greater fool. And I think it's always better to be the greater fool instead of sort of being the front runner and, you know, having to explain yourself probably a thousand times until people get it. Um, just geographically speaking, that's a very interesting childhood you had from South America <laughs> up to the north of Europe, essentially. Um if you look at it now, looking back with the Bitcoin knowledge, what is sort of the biggest difference for you between Argentina and Norway? Or is there any? Are we more close to each other than what we think? Like the differences between the two with the Bitcoin lens, you mean? Yeah, monetary speaking, economically speaking. Yeah, well, you know, I think that the monetary stuff um, and the technical aspects of Bitcoin is <clears throat> kind of like the two, one of the two main factors that a lot of people look into Bitcoin with. But I think uh, culture is, mm. is one kind of like underappreciated aspect of both Bitcoin, uh, but also the fact, uh, you know, looking at the uh, differences between Norway and Argentina. Culture drives everything, man. Like culture drives technology. Uh, culture drives monetary properties like the 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 culture kind of like uh, dictates what is going to be prioritized at any given moment right so if the culture of a certain place is um, you know closer to corruption and and kind of like uh, uh, you know hustling the next guy or something like that then all the technologies and all the properties of the local currency will definitely reflect that if that is, uh, you know, a, a culture that has um, penetrated all levels, right? Like two politicians to the smallest mm. uh, you know, individual level. And uh, but if you're a culture where like hard work is, uh, is, um, you know, respected, and it's kind of like the, the thing that people are chasing, and uh, you have a collective uh, mindset of like, you want to bring the country forward, then the monet the local currency will be better. You will have more, um, you know, um, uh, what do you call it? You will have people at the at the helm that are more responsible. Uh, so I think that that's like the difference between Argentina and Norway. To be honest, is the culture. Uh, in Argentina, sadly, um, there was a time where uh, hard work and building things were the DNA of of the of the country. Um, but that was like in a in a you know in a time and space where immigration from Europe was very fresh. There's a lot of people that came to Argentina from Europe with this sense of like, yeah, let's build this country, right? It, it, kind of like the same, you know, we share that history with, with the United States, basically. So you can basically look at Buenos Aires and New York City. They had the same influx of the same type of immigrants at the same time. 
and they all came with that like mentality, right? Um, sadly, that mentality is gone. That's not part of the culture in Argentina anymore. Things have definitely changed. Uh, so it is, you know, uh, sad to see. But Norway, on the other hand, was always like a very, a very poor country, a small country, uh, before they you know, <laughs> magically discovered, uh, uh, you know, black uh, black gold uh, back in the sixties and the seventies. Um, so the culture there is more like hardworking. We got to keep the community strong because they needed the community. They they were poor as fuck. So um, and like stealing from other people or just being corrupt, stuff like that was just frowned upon, you know, and still mm -hmm. to this day, that culture has somehow, I mean, native Norwegians would probably say, okay, things have changed and I'm sure they have, but the big, big tickets is still this. And that, that, that I think is the biggest uh, difference between Norwegians and Argentinians and maybe Northern Europeans and South Americans in a, in a larger scale as well. One thing I'm curious um, about and sort of like always thinking about is social economic structures and socialism, capitalism, Austrian economics, all this sort of stuff. And when you mention culture, it kind of brings it up for me in the sense that I wonder if in some way culture is connected in some way to the design of the fiat system in some way is culture like a, a design um because in the in, in the uk we've got this famous saying keep calm and carry on and it was about 10 years ago that was everywhere there was bags with it everyone wanted a poster <laughs> with it with the like the, the painting of the queen and in the background is a keep calm and carry on and that's kind of like the british mantra if you like and i'm just wondering whether that's kind of propaganda in a way part of the culture that we've been sort of ushered in to believe in that that's who we are as, as a society and i'm just wondering whether you've ever had any similar thoughts to that yeah man that's a good that's a good anecdote i mean that that's kind of like the, the very opposite of like yeah revolution now let's fucking fuck shit right. up and you know let's uh, rebel against the system it's the opposite of raging against the machine Mm. And I think that is definitely, you can see differences between Europeans as well. Right? Like you have the French that really loves to fuck shit up. And uh, <laughs> the Scandies are, I don't know, have there ever been a fucking revolution in Scandinavia ever? It, everything was pretty peaceful. Sweden used to be like in a union with Norway, Denmark as well. But they were kind of like just tossing Norway around. There, there weren't really any battles uh, mm. being fought, uh, with the exception of when when G the Germans invaded uh, Norway in the in the Second World War, uh, there was some resistance there. But like, I think it's just embedded in the culture just just to keep shit quiet and and don't make a fuss because um, things are very dire. But then again, like in Latin America, things are even more dire, and people don't they don't think twice about like um, you know shutting down a street or. Uh, doing mass protests in the street and kind of like rebelling. And I, I don't know. It's uh there's, there's many layers to this obviously, but mm. I, I think just in terms of culture, there's a type of people that are more rambunctious and other people that are more chill. And I think this is very hard to shake off. You will maybe see some degrees of distance from the most extreme cases. Uh, the, the more comfortable you get, the more richer you get, you probably you know sway away from, from that route. But uh, I think these are like um, differences that are embedded in anyone and it will reflect on whatever they invent, whatever system they try to create, uh, whatever, whatever they want to do. I do think, though, to be honest with you, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, the invention of the fiat system or the invention of democracy, whatever, was done in the West, right? Like these are these are concepts that were created uh, by uh, the political class. Uh, in ancient Greece or the political class in the you know modern Western uh, hemisphere, and um, it came out of a combination of necessity and and yeah, part of the culture and the way they thought things were correctly done. But uh, I don't really, I'm starting to think less and less that these systems are are good for the entire world. I, I honestly think there's a couple of countries who might not need democracy the way you know we think democracy is, or that you know obviously. Uh, the fiat system could be a thing that could potentially be responsibly done, but you have the temptation of printing more money is just going to be so much greater for an Argentinian because of the culture than, uh, I don't know, a Norwegian because of their culture, right? That, that temptation is strong when you are um, kind of 
you know, corrupt already, right? If that if that makes sense. So yeah. these are systems that are not perfect. Obviously, I mean, we are Bitcoiners, so we 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 definitely have our uh, issues with the with the fiat system, no matter how close to two percent inflation per year they they are. But there are responsible ways of running that system and irresponsible ways of running that system. And I think you know, uh, cultures who aren't uh, Western, they are more irresponsible. That's that's just the way it is. So you would think, well, do they need this system then? If things really go bad, maybe other systems uh, should uh, be implemented instead. I don't know. That's kind of like what I'm thinking about these days. <laughs> Sorry for the rants. No, no. Uh, all, all rants are welcome here, my friend. Um, when you were originally talking into your rabbit hole story and things, it sounds like your mum made a, a huge, difficult decision to move you guys over to Norway. What was that based in um, trying to escape the hyperinflation, socialism, or yeah. what, what was what was the cause of this massive choice to get you out of there? Well, don't want to like bore you guys with a history lesson, but I can give you like a short, short like summary of what happened in the years before. So mm. um, we had a very famous, well, to some people famous uh, president called uh, Perón, and uh, of course, Evita, which is more famous, uh, coming to power uh, in the late 40s, early 50s, right? So this is a guy who did something very, um, I mean, damn, props to this guy for pulling it off, though. Um, he was a guy who, like a military dude, he was a general <clears throat> in the military that was inspired by Franco in Spain, from Mussolini in Italy, and you know, you, you get where I'm going with this. And... So he was like in love with their system, uh, which was the fascist uh, system. So he came. So he went when, when he came into power in Argentina. He wanted to recreate that. He wanted to recreate, you know, Mussolini's Italy in Argentina. But the way that he did it wasn't using like fascist rhetoric. He managed to do a fascist system, which is I, I think if you look up the definition of fascism, is something along the lines of like totalitarian system that runs a government like enterprise you know it's a big enterprise um he did that he achieved that so he basically nationalized every single thing uh all, all the industries all the all the all the economy he basically nationalized which was uh the industries that these immigrants that i talked about five minutes ago uh, came to argentina to build from the private sector so he took completely control of that but he used that using left-wing socialist uh, rhetoric, which is mind-boggling. Like, how can you be a like a right-wing fascist, but you your actions are right-wing fascist, but your words are left-wing socialist? It's like incredible. Right. Anyway, so it, it, it's all about um, uh, you know the, the plea to the the most poor. Like, we have to uh, have a welfare state. We have to have human rights. We have to have essential rights. Blah blah blah. And all of that is ployed just to uh, print more money and give that money away and have the people depending on that money being printed especially right before you uh, have an election right so he kind of like started all of that and you know managed to be such a influential figure that even after his death other politicians came came into into power using that that rhetoric and using his image so by so this is late 40s early 50s all the way to like 76 um, there's a lot of lot of turmoil before that. A couple of military dictatorship that also happened because the the militaries were like fighting between themselves. But in '76, the last uh, junta came into power. They stayed into power until 1983, which is kind of like the the year where all Argentinians say we we came back to democracy. From that year, from 1983 to 1989, we changed the capital from Buenos Aires to a place called Viedma. Random, and then they and they were like, mm, "That's the bad idea. Let's 180 that. Let's go back to Buenos Aires." They changed the name of the currency and said, mm, "No, that's a, that was a bad idea too. Let's let's put that back." So it it was so much like fuckery happening in the years after 1983 that Argentina was just in a very very bad shape. Uh, inflation went I don't know how many thousand percents. So at that time in 88 89, my mom was like, she was 27 years old, 26 years mm -hmm. old, young mom. She was like, uh, this is this is just unbearable. Um, so she she left. The rest of my family stayed, and it was basically because of this socialist factions that always managed to have the power, with the exception of that military dictatorship. They were obviously right wing. 
they always came into power and just fucked up the money. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, you can say that in a way it was, um, you know, she left because of socialism, but it was just like the way socialists manage money. That was basically the reason. And of course, they manage money in a terrible way. So <laughs> that was pretty much it. It's a lot of that, uh, you know, history also one of the key reasons um, Millet won because, you know, if you read the mainstream media, and they're all telling you how bad he is and how extreme he is. Um, there was actually a German newspaper far that right, quoted. Isn't he? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, everyone is far right these days. Um, but uh, <laughs> there was a German newspaper that quoted um, if he got paid by Sill, the, uh, you know, the um, chainsaw company, <laughs> because he always used them. <laughs> it's like shit like this that is made up at the end of the day. Um, but could you maybe give us a deep dive into what Malay means for a lot of Argentinians because there are still some things, if you actually read these economical stuff, where you go, yeah, we'll see if it pays out. But I, I guess, generally speaking, he must have been one of the few Argentinians that went, no, fuck this, we actually need a revolution. Yeah, no, totally. And, and I, I, went on a, I, went, I did a podcast with Breedlove the other day where I, where I said exactly that, and I have tweeted about this as well. And it's like, hmm. okay, uh, you know, Millet is, is a very interesting guy. He definitely knows how to speak and can, you know, all these Austrian um, arguments have always, like, historically been very academic. So, you know, you, you, when, when, you, when you explain things in a very academic way, you, you instantly put up a barrier between you and normies, right? So, uh, you know, historically, these these uh, theories um, haven't really been popular, right? But he managed to crack the code, right? He was able to sneak in, you know, Mises and Rothbard and all kinds of good stuff uh, through becoming this living, breathing meme al almost, right? So he cracked the code, and I think that's that's huge. Um, but uh, now he is a politician, right? He's a he's a president, so he is inside of a system that runs on uh, compromises, right? It it runs on deals, it runs on uh, trade offs uh, between different factions, right? Uh, so he won't be able to do everything that he has said that, uh, that he will do. So I don't I don't I'm not really like at the edge of my seat uh, waiting for like a lot of the stuff that he said he will do. But um, like I said before. Uh, the cultural change is what is needed, right? Like, like I said in the beginning of our, our conversation, culture drives everything. It drives the decisions that you make, the inventions that you make, the technology that you want to bet on, everything. So if he, after these four years, are, is able to continue to, you know, fight that cultural fight, the cultural battle, and then if he gets reelected and gets another four years to do that, Man, I, I, then I, I'm, I'm super optimistic about Argentina because most than anything, it needs a drastic cultural change. And then if you can blow up the central bank in the process, okay, hell yeah, I would welcome that. But uh, anything else that he can do is a plus, but I really think the cultural change is the priority. And I think, to be honest, judging by his two, three, four months, he is really doing a lot of things that is forcing people to think about the current state of the of 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 the country, so I'm mm. hopeful for that. But in terms of like promises, hey, it's a politician. Let's not forget that, you know. So let's uh, keep our hopes uh, pretty pretty low. With Austrian economics, am I right in thinking there's like in in that in that theory there's minimal government intervention in in that economic structure, or or is it essential that there there is some kind of political structure involved and the reason why i'm asking that is because it seems like a lot of people in the bitcoin twitter ecosystem are, are relatively divided about politicians who support and mention bitcoin um as a good thing or a bad thing and there's a like constant debate about oh it's a politician like we, we're against it separate money from state and there's kind of this sort of like to in and fro in between um politicians uh putting some sort of positive spin on Bitcoin and whether that is a good thing. And I'm just wondering if you've got any kind of thoughts or feelings about that personally. Well, I, I, I don't know, man. I think uh, the best money usually wins uh, from the bottom up. So right. it doesn't really come from from the opposite. Like it doesn't come through a, a decree. It doesn't come through, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, a standard or or any law that that a politician passes it just organically mm. happens so obviously i prefer that way because then 
apart from the best money being used, you also the users of that money have a, a high degree of conviction as well, and uh, they're not using it because uh, otherwise they will be uh, penalized with 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 punishment, right? Uh, but then again, um, that's also ho hoping for a lot when it comes to humanity because <laughs> humans are right. being busy uh, dealing <laughs> with their own shit and uh, they don't have the time to sit down and, uh, you know, uh, a, a lot of people, they, they might use Bitcoin out of necessity, out of like very, you know, dark place, a very dark situation. So there's very many different ways to look at it. The, the, the one thing that I'm looking at it is like, hey, I'm all about hyper Bitcoinization, right? Like I work at a place uh, that creates infrastructure for this technology. And we are looking at many, many use cases, right? So we want to create infrastructure for many different things. Uh, and I think hyper Bitcoinization isn't, uh, you know, 8 billion people uh, paying for the groceries with Bitcoin using Lightning. Mm -hmm. I think hyper Bitcoinization uh, looks and feels very differently than what it currently is right now. And we got to build for all types of scenarios, all types of people, people that hate each other, people that love each other. Um, so some of that usage or some of that like cohort of users will probably come from a precedent like Bukele shilling Bitcoin like crazy and passing a, a, a legal tender law. Yep, that's fine. Uh, but then there will be other countries that will adopt Bitcoin at a straight up necessity, like Nigeria. That's fine too. I mean, everything, everything is good for Bitcoin. Um, I, I think it's kind of like uh, stupid to think that, no, 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 adoption needs to happen. Uh, these uh, stages, mm -hmm. uh, the, these phases, exactly how I want it. And not right. only should they adopt Bitcoin, but they should use it at a certain, t a certain way that I agree with as well. And I think those type of Bitcoiners, they really, uh, they miss the forest uh, for the trees. Uh, they really fail to see the big picture. And I think it's a huge disconnect that a lot of Bitcoiners have with just uh, humans, humanity. Um, I think people need to maybe travel more, uh, maybe <laughs> out of their eight Get out their mum's loft more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, about the, it's about the people that you listen to and the content that you curate for yourself at the end of the day, right? Mm -hmm. Like you have, you have 24 hours in a day, you're going on Twitter, you're going to these places to, to read, to, to learn, to, to interact with people. You got to be very picky. You got to be super good at curating that stuff. Uh, and a lot of people, they, they think they, they are not a slave to the algorithm, but they are, man. They, they, but they don't know. Mm -hmm. it. So a lot of, a lot of these, um, a lot of these, uh, ways of thinking, uh, they tend to dominate at certain times. But I think the, the, the solution is just build, uh, you know, build the tools, um, have people understand uh, the trade-offs of doing things on other layers, uh, learn about other value props, other use cases. And, and I think, hey, if a certain use case is not for you, that's cool, but that doesn't mean it's not for other, uh, other people as well. So you, people just need to accept that, you know, and uh, I have good hopes, man. I think we're we're way more mature in 2024 than we were in 2017. So, um, yeah, I think uh, I think we're on the right path. Yeah, definitely. And isn't it ironic that like most of these hardcore Bitcoiners who go by the rule of um, oh, you have to use Bitcoin the way I do, either work for the mm -hmm. same company um, from one uh, giant part of the Bitcoin adoption, um, or they're just buddies on Twitter, you know, so you kind of go again with this whole culture and social thing where they like stick together and try, try to drive these narratives. And al also when you mentioned, um, 8 billion people using Bitcoin over lightning, I kind of went, my mind went, this is what I sometimes mean by people explaining that they orange pill somebody. What does orange pilling actually mean at the end of the day? Because if you just try them to convince to download, let's go with Blockstream Green, for example, with a good Lightning wallet, um, and they go there and then they go, oh yeah, I have like 50 bucks worth of Bitcoin. In my book, okay, they have a touch point with Bitcoin, but maybe they have other viewpoints about it and stuff. Um, and I think we sometimes in the Bitcoin landscape fall down these own narratives we built. And I'm not going to use every um, tool in my arsenal to make a, a connection there to what you do with your uh, Bitcoin perception block. Because this is sometimes what we criticize the media for, like, oh, you know, fudsters and all of these things. But if you then look a bit behind the scenes, we kind of go like, yeah, we do the same thing. But what was, what was the motivation for you to actually start that? And it's not just a block where you go like, oh, yeah, that's what they said. You also do all of that research. You provide the data and such. How did you get started there? 
Okay, yeah, cool. I just want to touch on a couple of things that you said before asking me that question. So if I derive, please remind me of that question and we can talk about Bitcoin perception. But I, I think, to be fair, people who work at Bitcoin companies, they kind of like, they meet with the engineers, with the product people every day, right? They have very deep discussions about the product. So as a result of that, they have a very deep understanding of the product that maybe somebody out there who's not at the company, right? Like I, I get this with many of our products as well at Blockstream, right? Take Liquid, for example. Now we are definitely having a momentum for Liquid. I think more people are starting to understand like what kind of trade-offs uh, the specific Liquid is, as a layer two is uh, versus the base layer. We have more people, more influencers actually creating content, user generated content about Liquid. And I see that, oh shit, they are really understanding. I'm actually learning from them and kind of like uh, seeing very small, but very specific use cases that I didn't think about, for example. And that's a super healthy, super healthy thing. Um, so there's like people shilling their own products because they work at a company. Yeah, of course, there's a business incentive behind it. Yes. But I also think to be fair with them, that they, they, we are dealing with a lot of novel technology here and uh, people that work with them in day in and day out, they, 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 they can, they can, they have a different vision than somebody who maybe follows that company on Twitter and reads some tweets every day. So what I'm trying to say is um, I love the fact that more Bitcoin companies are, are, uh, you know, popping up uh, everywhere in the world that many Bitcoin companies that started like a couple of cycles back are still around today and are, you know, they have had the chance to develop their, their technology to be really, really good, or at least better than when they started. So I think that this the whole, like, the way that we will get to hyper Bitcoinization or whatever, or orange pulling the, the world, will be through businesses uh, being able to communicate the, the, their value props through marketing, by the way. Let's, let's you know, give props to Bitcoin marketers uh, who can kind of, like, cut through the noise and distill like, this is what you want to do. This is how the tool is helping you do it. So you mm. get the job done. And that's why you need to use this specific tool. And then we kind of like, you know, we uh, quantify that uh, as, we, yep. as we move along. Sorry, uh, Joel, you wanted to chime in. And, and this sometimes means, and I know this is something like hardcore OG, well, not hardcore OGs, hardcore um, x Karens on Bitcoin Twitter like to go about. <laughs> um, I literally had the other day, my boss had to send me a message like, just ignore it, don't reply to the tweet. And I kind of go, this is the inner journalist in me, where I, I have to be right at this moment, or I have to go into the debate, where I go, no, he just doesn't get what you just said. It takes businesses for these things to adopt. And yeah, this sometimes means that you use a business strategy to convince people of Bitcoin, because this is what we need to do at the end of the day. We need to show the advantages. And yeah, this sometimes means that you need to pick out a trick of your marketing box and you go out there and you use other strategies that are maybe not grassroots, but yeah, at the end of the day, they contribute to, you know, having more people using Bitcoin. And isn't that the goal we all should use? Yeah, no, and also like uh, the entire space is also, I mean, this is Bitcoin, right? So it kind of like has, <laughs> it is, it is a, very contrarian space. So you, a lot of the people who are looking at your technology will look at it with a <clears throat> contrarian lens. Kind of like, I'm just going to be against it just because, right? That's kind of like the, the modus operandi. And then you got you to start from there and kind of like chip at it uh, slowly over time. And then maybe they will get around to it. Maybe never they will get around to it. Maybe their beef is actually not the product, but the people behind it. So like, uh, and you know, um, I, I had a I had a opinion piece on you know, Bitcoin Magazine last year I think it was now that was basically Bitcoin is not for everyone right uh, this for the, the same reason that a lot of people will just like hate on Bitcoin just because a lot of people that are Bitcoiners will hate certain companies or certain uh, products just because so mm -hmm. they have their own very personal conviction of like what is right and wrong uh, in this world and to shake that uh, I rather spend my time and energy on people who are more open, who aren't so entrenched into their own convictions. And, you know, ultimately, Bitcoiners aren't really special. We're all humans, right? And humans have this like defense mechanism where we have so much shit going on every single day that we need to be very careful about what we believe in, how much time we spend on learning new stuff. We got to be, mm -hmm. we, we manage our time very carefully, right? So if you already have like a life, uh, see life through a very special lens 
you're kind of content with that lens. You're like, hey, mm -hmm. I understand life. Life makes sense to me when I see you through this lens. If somebody comes from from the left and say, no, 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 this lens is completely wrong. You're idiots yeah, for thinking that this is the the, the truth. Here, uh, here is Bitcoin, and you're gonna like learn this, and you're gonna unlearn everything that you have un uh, learned through 10, 15 years of school. That is not an easy task, right? So the same logic applies to Bitcoiners who have been here since 2015, 16, 17. They have had so much time to make up their mind about something that to shake them out of that belief, uh, it's maybe not worth it, man. Maybe it's better to just go to a, a cohort or a group of people that are, because of their situation, they're they're more ready, right? Mm. And I say it's about just orange pilling in general. Uh, mm. I don't want to spend my time um, uh, orange pilling, trying to or, or convince uh, the Guardian journalist about Bitcoin <laughs> when there's probably <laughs> some, some kid in Argentina with a laptop that is dreaming about getting a remote work and providing getting, I don't know, uh, dollar exposure through work. I'd rather mm. spend my time with that guy uh, teaching him about Bitcoin and Lightning and getting paid in Bitcoin through remote work. I think that is like way mm. better time spent if that makes sense so yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i i genuinely believe like half of the bitcoin twitter people who respond to jemima kelly for any article she puts out <laughs> on bitcoin are either because they uh they fancy her um <laughs> you know um or they just like to go into this debate but, but having said that though this is again where personality and culture kicks in i yeah. know from myself i need to like close my laptop have my phone in another room at the end of the day because I could be a dick on purpose sometimes, and it's funny to like, you know, trigger the Karens or whoever is actually in your, in your replies. Um, but yeah, it definitely has a lot of point that everyone has to start anywhere, and yeah. we all have our histories and all of our backgrounds. But to get back on track, how did you start the Bitcoin Perception newsletter slash research lab? Is that a fair way to say it is? I mean, if you want to be fancy about it, yeah, maybe I can steal that from you. Um, you know, <laughs> Talking about marketing. We're, we're a research firm. Yeah, we, we, can, we can maybe brainstorm a couple of uh, definitions later, and then uh, I can put you as a co-founder. Co uh, the, uh, the thing about Bitcoin perception is that I, as a, you know, I lead the marketing communications team at Blockstream, right? So it's something I'm thinking about all the time. And um, I came to a point where I was like, ah, I feel like there's something happening in the mainstream media. Like I'm starting to see like inbound requests, right? Like, hey, I want to interview Adam back, for example, right? From these new names that I didn't really know or from like, uh, I'm talking about reporters, right? But then also from like outlets that I was like, hmm, these people have kind of like been hostile to Bitcoin previously, just from like the back of my mind. Uh, why are they like, why are they interested in Blockstream, Bitcoin or Adam back for that matter? Um, and I was thinking, hmm, it would be good to like check a reporter uh, or an outlet's history of Bitcoin coverage and kind of like get a feel of like, have these people been negative, balanced, positive, and then for, like for certain time frames. And I was kind of like looking for a solution or, or like or, or like a research lab or or something that could tell me very quickly whether you know, yeah, you know, quick reply to these uh, to these questions. And I didn't, so I built it. That's that's you know. Necessity is the mother of all inventions, right? So uh, I was like, okay, I'm going to build this. I'm going to start tracking the 40 uh, biggest uh, mainstream media outlets uh, globally uh, in English. And I'm going to just, every time they mention the word Bitcoin in a video or, or a publication, I'm going to track that. And yeah, I started doing that. There's a bunch of like hacky shit that I had to just, uh, you know, chat GPT my way through. But it's uh it's it's a pretty solid system now that every time somebody writes or makes a video about Bitcoin, I get like a new row in my spreadsheet and I and I see this every single day. And then I I took that data and I made it into a dashboard so I can kind of like go through the data pretty quickly and pretty smoothly. And when I started seeing that dashboard, I was like, yo, this is this is nice. This I, I need to put this visual some somewhere. So I was like, okay, let me create a Twitter account uh, where I just tweet about my findings. And then that quickly also like uh, you know pivoted to apart from the Twitter account also start creating uh, research reports, mm. and I think there's a lot of activity. So I think a weekly report is is justified, you know. So that's mm. what I've been doing. I started that five months ago, and uh, yeah, I have about one thousand three hundred followers on Twitter and a little bit over a thousand subscribers uh, in total. 
um, subscribing uh, to my newsletter. So I think it's a really good start and a nice little signal of like other people other than me also thinking that this was something that they they needed in their life. So yeah, that's, that's really really cool, mate. And so what the, so what sort of trends and biases are happening then since you started it? Is there any sort of things that are happening that are fascinating to you or something you didn't expect now that this is uh, something you're focused on yeah i mean the first thing that i saw which i mean there's a lot of mis i mean okay let me see let me backtrack here as a bitcoiner i think you already have like a a, a strong opinion about what the press is right so it's and it's yeah. going <laughs> to be negative right so i was i was like catching myself as i was looking at the data like damn i i have a very negative view of the mainstream media, because as I was uh, going through the data, I saw like nice articles and I'm tracking. It's not like I started tracking when I started five months ago and I only have five months worth of data. I have data from January 1st, 2018, uh, all the mm. way up here. Right. So I was looking at stuff like that was written back in 2018, 2019, uh, uh, and there was like some really in-depth uh, stuff from Al Jazeera that you know, covered, um, I think it was like a hydro dam in China. And they were like, they sent reporters down there, took some pictures uh, of the workers that were like literally sleeping there overnight and, and and like had like a coverage of that. I can't remember which company it was, or even if they're still existing, but that was like back in, that's 2018. That's like ancient history in Bitcoin time, right? So I was like, what happened to those stories, right? Like what, why Mm. did they kind of like disappear? and become became all fuddy and then when i was looking at newer stuff i was like okay now there's like a new generation of reporters that are kind of like coming into this business or this space and they are writing about bitcoin with um genuine curiosity like they're not really out there to do hit pieces which is like okay this is what i thought the mainstream media was doing like okay we when we do cover bitcoin it is going to be negative um so I started seeing this like early 2018, a lot of like, you know, natural curiosity pieces was was being made. Then it was like a, I don't know what happened in between. And then now uh, these more in-depth things are coming back. So it's like, okay, this is, this is something that I just need to really look more into. And then, you know, ever since I have been trying to tweet and, and, and write in my newsletter about the findings that I, mm. that I discover. Uh, another thing that is also very recent is like the having, like mm. since Q4 uh, last year, the having started to be a, a, a term that you see in publications and in in videos and like you know CNBC newsrooms. They they're talking about the having, trying to like understand what it is, <laughs> and then they they say stuff like, oh, it's a software upgrade. You know, it's Bitcoin software upgrade. Like weird terms, but you can see. They're mm-hmm. trying to understand. They're not like, ah, it's shit. This is mining. Oh, it's bad for the environment. No, no. They're trying to be like, let's talk about the having. Let's try to go deeper into understanding mm-hmm. it in a way that makes sense. And I think that's great. And so, yep. you know, I think a lot of Bitcoiners, they they need to change their minds a little bit. And uh, hopefully my data uh, can mm. provide that transparency so they can actually see uh, that, mm. hey, the tides are kind of changing. There's a new generation of younger people coming into the space that are looking at Bitcoin and trying to cover it in a neutral, curious way. Um, not to say that the usual suspects are not writing their hit pieces. Hit pieces. <laughs> yes, they are. But it's not a. It's just not a monolith anymore. It's uh, yep. not just one thing. So I, I think uh, this fragmentation is very interesting, uh, especially when we are where we are in the adoption cycle. And I think it's important that people can track it and actually visualize it. Yeah, 100%. And this is one of the things I see in my day job, uh, probably every hour, because um, you know I am very active in contact with a lot of the journals. Um, I'm very lucky that I actually am fluent in German, English, and French, which sort of aligns also with the uh, vision of what Relay wants to do in the next couple of months and years. And often when I speak to them, it's always a negative event they had. You know, uh, I literally spoke to uh, someone from um, uh, Handelsblatt earlier this week, and she went, I had people at an event in Berlin screaming at me <laughs> why, why she had a typo in a Bitcoin article. And I kind of went, ooh, I suspect, uh, I suspect uh, the, the people, you know, who, who, who could it be? 
and I asked her and then she just had some misconceptions. She generally didn't understand like why the halving was taking place mm-hmm. and why the different, um, you know, uh, like a difficulty adjustment happens and all of these things. And I just broke it down to the simple sparrier. Uh, explaining it to like a five-year-old and she went this is for the first time where someone genuinely was interested in actually you know talking to me and I kind of went oh fuck this is sad and then I have other events you know at um, like media events when you go there where people who might cover crypto more generally or broadly and they then see the difference and um, you know a lot of times I just give them a fair point where they go like it loses a lot of energy I go yep that's undebatable. You know, we, we can't change that fact, but you have to look at the way it's being used and especially how you compare that data, right? If you compare it to the banking sector, to data centers as a whole, um, this is a fraction of what's being used. And, you know, talking about environmental issues and stuff, compare it to gold. Like, how's gold being mined? What does it take compared to Bitcoin? And if you, the more you do these kind of things, the more they go, oh, now I get what you mean. And, and this is all I want to have because that's where curiosity kicks in and where they go, I need to find out more about this. And I generally believe that most people who work at these outlets, if they don't have a senior level, um, they're not interested in writing fuck pieces. They're not interested in sitting at a shitty cubicle all day long and you know having to write yet an article, bad article. Um, but they're interested in finding out more, which is sort of a positive spin on the whole journalism whole uh, journalism world as a whole. Um, because if a lot of Bitcoiners, I'm convinced, get a peek behind it, you would not want to live in that world hmm. any minute of the day because it is quite sad and it is quite miserable. Um, so props to you that you actually also give this opportunity to fellow Bitcoiners to learn more. Um, and I'm curious if you sometimes see these these articles going out now that you've sort of peeked behind a curtain do you still react emotionally because you go oh fuck they still haven't got it or <laughs> are you a bit more calm where you go okay this might be that angle or that angle and i don't know maybe you haven't gotten in touch with one of these journals who have written these let's call them hit pieces or badly informed uh, research depends, papers it depends on my mood of the day man if i'm triggered by something <laughs> you know, I'm be triggered by this as well <laughs> no yeah. I, I think that i think that this uh, is where you get the fernando fuck you emails <laughs> <laughs> no i mean uh, also just to touch on couple of things that you said like i mean yeah there are some journalists who just want to do great stories and they want to feel free and they want to be uh, autonomous and whatever but let's be let's be real there are journalists who just do this as a day job and they're kind of like monkeys behind a keyboard and like if uh the editorial desk uh tells them no this this is this is something bad because we saw that you know greenpeace they they just released this uh, report uh you got to cover it and uh this is this has to be uh, uh you know a negative negative sentiment article and then people will do it they're, they're you know most people are like that so um there's a there's a mix of like individual reporters who have their own convictions but they might like you said they might be senior so they have more autonomy and they can uh, choose their own stories and then the majority are not right they are just trying to like work the corporate ladder and uh they do as they told so, but, but that's also why it's important to have this data, right? So that, that you can actually uh, choose uh, the name of a reporter. You can go to the Bitcoin Perception uh, dashboard and uh, literally choose the reporter's name. It's not an outlet level. Well, that that too. But you can also choose an individual reporter and kind of like follow uh, the timeline of like, is this mostly negative, mostly balanced, mostly positive, or, or, or all three? Um, but yeah, in terms of like educating journalists and, um, you know, orange pilling them in a way, which I think your question is about, uh, it's kind of like the same, to be honest, it's the same the same approach that you should have with like orange pilling people in general. Uh, pick carefully who you want to orange pill. Like I said in the beginning of, the, of our, our convo, I'm not spending too much time on the Daily Mail and the Guardian. Sorry. I mean, the British... The British newspapers are pretty bad. Sorry, Ian. Uh, I'm not saying I'm not saying anything you don't know from before, but the mm. Brits, the Brits are embarrassingly bad at this. And you look yeah. at like also this like the silence is also speaking volume. Right? Like if you go to, to to my dashboard and you look at the Financial Times uh, coverage of Bitcoin, for example, and it is minimum, like mm. almost non-existent. And you would think like, holy shit, like. Your financial times, you should like with a, with something like Bitcoin, which is like the eighth or the seventh largest asset in the world, you it deserves to be covered by a financial publication of the status of the FT. But they choose not to. I think that speaks volumes. Um, 
you know, especially yeah. the fucking what's it called, Bonville block, or what they always rebrand the fucking yeah. block about. Yeah, mm. um, they missed the mark. Let, let's call it what it is. <laughs> they, they, I think the first time I heard about it or read in it was twenty. 14 before it turned into like this super fashion high conglomerate uh, media block. Yeah. Um, and I know people who've written this stuff. I go like, how can you miss this? And they go like, oh, you know, I actually bought my cocaine with Bitcoin. And I go like, fucking hypocrite at the end of the day. Like you, first of all, <laughs> kids don't do drugs. Um, and if you do, like, <laughs> please, <laughs> please don't do it in, in large conglomerates. And don't pay for it with Bitcoin because it's stupid. Um, and on the other end of the day, like, you write about it being drug money and then you use it to buy drugs and, and you still miss the mark on what potential it has. But then again, you know, that's where ego kicks in because they want to be the cool, hip media guy or girl uh, in this case. And um, yeah, just want to either bash it all day long or be the, be, the, be the different editorial team in the newsroom. Yeah, and I think also like uh, a lot of... They might be salty no coiners at the end of the day, right? Like they they mm. know they missed the the train and they're like, ah oh, man, okay, I have a personal vendetta uh, against this because I did know about it in 2013, and if I could, uh, if I if I had uh, you know uh, bought Bitcoin back then, it would have been a different story. Well, maybe they they would they probably would have sold in 2014 when when it was like 150 bucks, but still, you know what I mean? Like they they have kind of like been sitting on the sideline for so long. With this uh, specific attitude, uh, they're not going to be shaken and and think differently right now. So that's why it is important to kind of like uh, catch the uh, the new names as early as possible uh, and like have that as part of your like communication strategy where you're like, hey, uh, I see that you're a new name at Bloomberg and you're writing a lot of cool pieces. Let me just open the door for you. And, that, you know, for example, at Blockstream, we have done that, right? Like we we have... Uh, something that we call a uh, uh, media briefing, right? So we invite the press to just hop on a Zoom with us. It's not live streamed or it's just an internal call. And they can just uh, come and ask questions, but we also show them, like, this is what we're building. This is who it's for. Mm. This is why we think it's important. And then that's it. Write a story if you want. We try to put some nuggets there so they can kind of like pick it up. And they do. They, they did in the last one. Uh, but um, it's mostly just to bring them closer uh, and just to know that, hey, you know, at least this is one company in the Bitcoin space who are doing good things. And whether they believe it in or not, I don't know. I can't really care too much about it. The important thing is what I can do, what I can control or us as blockchain, what we can control is creating that forum, creating that platform so that people can come, see what we are working on, and ask any questions that they want. And, mm. uh, you know, stuff like that, I think it's important to do. And mm. to catch mm. these new reporters early, they're going to, first of all, they're going to like the attention. They're going to be like, okay, you're inviting me to this special thing. Okay, yeah, they're going to come. <laughs> um, but then they are, they it's their mandate to learn the most about this uh, industry. So they will say yes yeah, to something like that. And then uh, you might be able to influence their coverage a little bit, at least, you know, not like influence in a manipulative way, but just influence them in terms of facts and, mm. and then uh, not really pushing any narrative, just like presenting what we're doing. And then they can drive their own conclusions and uh, driving, nurturing that relationship from the early, early start, I think, is going to pay off big time for companies like Blockstream and other people who choose this type of strategy in the next, uh, you know, three, four, five years and beyond. Because these reporters will become senior and, you know, at that when they get to that phase, they will hopefully have a good, good uh, impression of certain players in the Bitcoin space. So they won't be affected by other news, other negative headlines, because a lot of these journalists, they, they do that. Like mm -hmm. I have so many journalists that I'm trying to like reach out to, which just, they ghost me, but I know that they keep creating certain stories. And I see that also in Bitcoin perception uh, dashboard that they kind of like, they, they copy paste headlines from each other. They copy paste paragraphs yeah. and put it into the article. So they look at each other more than they look at us. So we got to like say, Hey, we're here, like drive attention to us. And, and hopefully influence them in that way. And that's kind of like the, the healthy, best way to do it, even though it's mm. a very slow moving train and it's going to take a lot. It's a very long term strategy. But um, I think that's sustainable and what we should do. But hey, I can only control what we do at Blockstream. I can't speak for the entire Bitcoin space, but I do mm. 
hope that more companies are taking that approach. I think it's the, the best approach to take. That's really yeah, we cool do. inviting these, sorry, um, sorry, Joel, inviting these mainstream media or journalists into you know, op opening your doors, right? And, and I think your main um, title on your website is Rethinking Trust, right? Um, so you're, you're trying to invite these people in and uh, you reveal this open source technology and the work that you're doing in the, in the ecosystem at Blockstream. What, what exactly is Blockstream and what is it um, you're trying to do there? Well, um, Blockstream is um, an infrastructure uh, company, a Bitcoin infrastructure company. So everything that we build is uh, on top of Bitcoin. We, I mean, Adam and his co-founders back in 2014, uh, the whole like raison d'etre, the, the Blockstream was we have to build, we have to scale Bitcoin in layers, right? So it's more about like the Linux philosophy, the, the, the kind of like that, that type of, that type of, uh, layered, uh, architecture thinking that led them to, to create Blockstream, uh, in, uh, to pursue these technologies and, and build stuff like side chains, uh, lightning, right? Like that we have our own implementation of lightning, <clears throat> but then also later on, we, we develop our own wallet. We have our hardware wallet later on and. We kind of like do do it all. Um, we we have a hardware wallet. We do we, we do satellites. Uh, we we trans transmit the Bitcoin blockchain through satellites. We do mining. We do many different things within mining. I mean, there's a lot of things that we do. I think in any any aspect of Bitcoin, I think Blockstream is working on something uh, in that in that little um, you know pocket. So uh, and it's one of the longest living Bitcoin only companies, right? Like I said, founded in 2014, so that's 10 years. And um, yeah, we're just trying to push uh, Bitcoin forward uh, with new and exciting things. Um, that's basically it. That's brilliant. And yeah, the work the uh, at Blockstream is is very, very fascinating and, and the development there is most definitely, I mean, because you get a lot of um, debate about what layer twos are, what is on built on top of Bitcoin. But I think at Blockstream, you're really sort of sticking to the pure sort of uh, relating it directly back to Bitcoin without any of the obscure sort of other side chains, this and the other going on, right? Uh, or yeah, I mean, are you are you sort of like sticking fundamentally to just building directly on top of Bitcoin and other solutions? Yeah, no, we do also do work on Bitcoin Core, right? Like we have a research team as well, and right. we many many contributors to Bitcoin Core has uh, either been employed at, at Blockstream at one point or received uh, you know a sponsorship or, or grants from Blockstream. So um, both the base layer and other layers, we 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 have uh, built stuff or or participated or contributed to. Um, in terms of <laughs> what is a real layer two, I think. <laughs> I think a lot of, I think, first of all, I don't think there's a consensus on what a real layer two is. So mm. anyone who says this is not a real layer two, this is a real layer two, that whatever, whatever thing that they're pointing to is just their own conviction. There's really no consensus. Mm. This is just a very subjective opinion, right? Um, like you can't unilaterally exit, for example. That is like one of the things that I've, that I keep hearing about. But it's not really a good definition uh, of it. It is not a catch-all. Uh, it, it might be one criteria of many, but I think that is kind of like the point, right? Like, I think some people, they just love to debate what is a real layer two forever. But most people understand trade-offs and just mm -hmm. use the tools. Uh, yep. And I think that's, that's the people that, I'm, that I, that I want to talk to, right? Um, if you... You know, Bitcoiners are is just a weird, weird people, man. Like on one side, <laughs> Nick Nick Batia's book Layered Money gets all the praise in the world because mm. it kind of like explains how money actually works best in layers. But once you introduce like layers to Bitcoin, no, then all of a sudden that's not good. But then if you want to do stuff on Bitcoin, that's not good neither. So I don't know. Uh, I think that um, Liquid Lightning. Um, Mercury layer, uh, you know, projects like those, uh, Rootstock even, um, are like real serious projects. And then unfortunately, maybe because of Liquid, Rootstock, mm -hmm. and Lightning, uh, and now it has become a fad uh, to say I'm a Bitcoin layer 2 company, 
uh, you know. Mm. So maybe we should pat ourselves on the back for like putting for making Bitcoin Layer Two a hot thing, <laughs> because there's so many uh, shit chains uh, that are just uh, putting that brand on themselves to maybe get another uh, funding round. I don't know. Uh, so yeah. that is kind of like a, a a thing right now that I'm that I'm not the biggest fan of. I think this mm. is eventually this is a fad that will die like any other fads. Uh, but liquid is definitely not part of that. Um, even though many people might say, "Oh shit, anyone is calling anything a layer two, can't put liquid in that category." There's certain projects that you need to look at extra hard, and not even extra hard. Just look at them, and you will see it's not uh, it's not a it's not a layer two branding exercise like many of these other companies are doing nowadays. So you know, I take that criticism very. I laugh at that, to be honest. I don't entertain it too much, even though I, I fall victim to that. And I do engage in some minor flame wars on Twitter with somebody. Uh, but I, I think the majority of people are understanding stuff like Mercury Layer and Liquid way more better than they did a couple of years ago. And they're just using it. They're using the tools. They're building. Companies are building stuff on top of these layers. And it's just an exciting ecosystem. And, I, you know, it's, it's very, very good to see. Yeah. And, you know, we're still so... I know it sounds corny, but we're still so early in the process that we can experiment with these different thought principles. And um, it's ironic that you say something very similar that we um, heard David Bailey say a couple of weeks ago on our show as well, where he went, you know, we are covering ordinals, for example, for this exact reason. Yes, you can maybe make the assumption of the investment scheme behind it. But, you know, again, businesses, businesses need to generate money to stay afloat. So they decided to opt in for that path. And hey, if it doesn't pay out, we were wrong. We're big enough to say, okay, we fucked up. We'll move on. Uh, and I guess the whole layer debate will go the similar fashion, uh, at least for the foreseeable couple of cycles, probably. Yeah, I don't like JPEGs on, on a blockchain. I, am, I, I don't want to buy one. Um, I'm just not interested. But that doesn't mean yeah. other people aren't allowed <laughs> to be interested in that. Uh, dude, it's uh, uh, if we are all about freedom, I think we should you know, live to that and let people do whatever they want to do. Like, okay, if you want to pay one Bitcoin for one sat, <laughs> hey, man, me, man, <laughs> I don't really care. I'm never going to do that. But if you find something valuable, I used to, I used to collect basketball cards when I was a kid. And I, in my adult life, I also tried to get serious into flipping uh, sports cards. I totally understand the, 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 not necessarily only the value of something, but just the culture, the identity, the, you know, you feel like you belong to a community that are cool, that are special. And hey, be my guest. But I, I myself, I don't care. And that's the only thing I should care about, what I do. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, whether Ordinals becomes a thing in five or it still exists five to ten years from now. If they do, I I, I don't know. Uh, then it's just a, another use case on Bitcoin. I really don't think people should spend so much time thinking about it. It's the technology is, is is sound in the way that a transaction goes through, right? It gets validated like any other transaction. So that's pretty much it. Um, you know, code is law, and uh, what other personal opinions or flavors or preferences people have, hey man, mind your own business. Like honestly. Um, just let people do whatever they want to do. People do the most stupid shit every single day. Are you going to be like the police and go out like you know, open the window and scream at people at the street if you think they do something that you find is stupid or not wise? I mean, come on. It's uh, uh, yeah, it's more of a thing where people need to go outside and touch grass more than anything. Yeah, 100, Fernando. I'm completely with you on that one, for sure. And you mentioned Mercury Layer, and I'd be amiss not to mention a friend of mine, Nicholas Gregory, is doing some fantastic work over uh, for Mercury Layer. Um, we're going to close the show now, but before we do, we always love to do the All Roads Lead Back to Bitcoin Challenge, where we challenge each of our guests to uh, prove that all roads do, in fact, lead back to Bitcoin by giving you a word and or phrase that you have to then try and lead it back to Bitcoin. <laughs> okay. So seeing as you're coming over here to good old Blighty, the UK, shortly, we thought fish and chips might be a good thing to ask you to try and relate back to Bitcoin somehow. So Fernando, have a second and think, how does fish and chips relate back to Bitcoin? Cool. Damn, you probably have the answer because you probably thought about this super hard, haven't you? <laughs> uh, Fish and chips and Bitcoin. Mm. They're they're yellow and nice and crispy. I love I love the <laughs> feeling. I love the feeling of a fresh 
sat in my wallet. So that's kind of like when you take the fish out of the fryer. It's like sat sizzling and nice. Has the right color. And um, man, that's, that's <laughs> really, really bad. I absolutely have no clue, man. The only connection between fish and chips and Bitcoin is I'm going to fucking devour a lot of fish and chips when I come to England. And, and I'll show you a nice little spot I know that you might be able to buy some fish and chips with some uh, Satoshis if you're willing to part with them anyway. So, yeah, <laughs> Fernando, mate, it's been brilliant. Is there anything you want to shill or mention before uh, Joel closes? No, if you're interested in uh, following the mainstream media's coverage of Bitcoin, go to bitcoinperception.com just, or just Google Bitcoin Perception. If you uh, want to check out what we're doing over at Blogstream, go to blogstream.com. Uh, get familiar with uh, all our products and see if anything's there is uh, of your liking. And uh, that's it. Uh, follow me on Twitter if you want to catch some retarded ass tweets uh, at BaseLayer. <laughs> That's a good username, yeah. actually. Yeah, I, I'm pretty. I'm pretty proud of yeah, that. Yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> nice, nice. Fernando, it was lovely having you on. Uh, thanks for your finite time and for all of our listeners' finite time. And as always, stay curious. <laughs>